Hi, I am Anup Kumar, CTO for Data and AI Asia Pacific. Today, I am excited to host IBM Policy Lab. So today we have Dennis Wong, Assistant Chief Executive, Data Innovation and Protection Group, IMDA Singapore. And today we are going to talk about trustworthy AI. So Dennis, why don't we start with your quick intro and probably a bit of overview about you know, our generative AI model governance framework. Thank you so much, Anu, and thank you to IBM for the great partnership so far, especially in the AI Verify Foundation. Um, so I'm Denise. Uh, I, as, as you say, the Assistant Chief Executive of the Data Innovation and uh, Protection Group, um, also the Deputy Commissioner of the Data Protection Commission in Singapore. Um, and in this role and capacity, I have the honor and privilege and also the responsibility of looking after um, data policy as well as the um, AI governance policy um, in Singapore. Um, so you mentioned our model governance framework. Um, it's still in proposed draft um, and we're in the midst of seeking international comments on it. And as you know, generative AI has been all the rage. Um, it's got significant transformative potential, but also comes with risks. Um, and so we, what we wanted to do was to look at and pull together uh, some of the international conversations that have been happening in this space and, and to look at a systematic and comprehensive way um, of identifying some of these dimensions that are relevant specifically for generative AI, but building on some of the concerns and issues that we've seen in traditional AI, uh, because we had actually put out a model governance framework from 2018 uh, and updated it in 2020. Uh, but this edition really builds on that to look at the risks, concerns, issues, but also opportunities that generative AI specifically brings. So I think uh, we had nine dimensions that we identified um, and a big part of it is about the accountability. Um, but we also looked at the model development life cycle and what trustworthy uh, AI and, and responsible AI means uh, from that entire end-to-end -end model development life cycle. Looking at trusted development and deployment, um, looking at uh, third-party testing, um, and also saying some things about incident reporting because no model is foolproof. And we called out other specific issues such as um, data, uh, copyright, which are very difficult issues. Um, we also looked at things like misinformation and so trusted content um, and what that means in the generative AI context. Um, and rounding up, uh, we looked very much at what AI for the public good really means. So that's an interesting point of the AI for public good because if you look at the IBM point of view, you know, basically on the trusty, trustworthy AI, we had a three tenant, right? One was like, you know, governing high risk AI development. Second was the accountability, like, you know, in terms of making sure that, you know, both the developer and the deployers are accountable for AI. Mm. And the third was about, you know, open AI innovation. Mm. Okay. And this perfectly aligned with, you know, what you're talking about AI for public good. Can you give me some, I will say examples, like what we really mean when you're talking about from AI for public good from a regulatory perspective? Well, I think AI for the public good is really a broader concept that goes beyond regulation or regulatory perspectives. Um, so I think what we tried to call out both in the National AI Strategy 2.0, which was released late last year, uh, which is really detailed Singapore strategy, um, but also in the model governance framework, which takes a more international lens to what good governance looks like. Um, in, the, in the model governance framework, we identified, for example, democratizing access. Uh, we looked at what upskilling means, sustainability. Um, so there are different components uh, that any society needs to think about when we look at uh, how AI can really be, uh, the, the benefits of AI can really be harnessed for the end user, for the public citizen that's on, you know, that uh, should really learn, uh, be able to benefit from this technology. And I can just give you two national examples um, of programs that we have, uh, which are mechanisms that we try and use um, to bring out this idea for, of AI for the public good. And these are just examples from our Singapore context. And one is really the Digital uh, for Life movement, um, which really looks at 
um, teaching of digital skills to the public um, and giving them the skills and ability and, uh, and equip them with enough knowledge um, to really harness the benefits of digitalization. And the other program that I'll briefly touch on is the Senior School Digital Program, which is really about giving senior citizens access uh, to digital tools, um, and of which of generative AI is one. Um, so we've had already some experience um, in reaching out to different communities within our population, um, and we can leverage on these existing mechanisms um, to also teach them about the risks, but also the benefits uh, of generative AI. So basically what you're talking about is, you know, AI not limited to few people, but, you know, deployed at a scale. Right? Exactly. You know? I think democratizing access uh, to uplift the entire community is a very key tenet of AI for the public good. And, and we do, when we think about AI governance and AI of regulation with a small r, that's what we, we think about very much with it, that end in mind. Thank you. Oh, well, you know, when we talk about, you know, governance, right, one of the key you know, point uh, every time I am talking to our customers, you know, uh, oh, it comes about, okay, you have defined a framework, you have defined what are the key stuff to take care. At the end, it breaks down to the deployment. And at that point of time, the biggest question is at this point in time, who decide what is the matrix, you know, for deployment of the risk, right? Like every model has got some pertinent risk and they are different metrics. The important is to capture out the threshold, yeah. right? Who defines that? You know, this is a big question. So my customers are asking me, and uh, uh, while IBM has built a platform where you can define and measure the metrics, but you know, we are not saying that this should be the threshold because it depends on application to applications, right? Depends on the industry. Where, where we are going with, you know, from your policy perspective? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, and at this point in time, it's the technology is still very young, very nascent. Um, and a lot of it, uh, the, the frameworks that we have developed and the tooling that we've built is very much around the idea of self compliance because there is a, there is some benefit to having mechanisms whether it's policy frameworks or tools that allows a, a deployer to show to their customer or to their buyer that this um, system can do what I say it does um, and the AI verify toolkit for example and, and your toolkits uh, might be similar um, is built around that idea of demonstrating your own compliance um, of course there is that part about um, third party and independent testing and assurance as well. Um, and that uh, also allows uh, demonstration um, through an independent process, a third party process, to show that certain thresholds are being met. Um, but we're not at the stage today uh, to draw certain thresholds, bearing in mind also that those tend to be very sector, sector and use case specific. So indeed, we are working back in with our sectorial partners um, and, and to look at what, the, what safety means or what governance means or what responsible AI means in healthcare or in finance. And all of those can have very different ideas uh, of what thresholds are necessary. I will say that we did put out um, a catalog uh, for, for evaluations of LLMs, um, and that was launched together with our Generative AI Sandbox, because I, we think that this is very much a live issue and a live exercise of trying to determine what are the appropriate uh, evaluations and benchmarks um, for specific deployments. Um, and it's still very much, I think, a live issue and a work in progress. Yeah, so I think this is what we say to my customer, so I think that's what you're emphasizing. In real sense, it's a shared responsibility. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we covered the two important aspect of your nine uh, point framework, right? Accountability and, you know, uh, AI for public good. Uh, was wondering, like, you know, we already have a framework earlier for the traditional AI, mm -hmm. right? What prompted you to put a new one instead of, you know, trying to maybe upgrade the previous framework? Excellent question. I think, um, and two things I'll call out. One is that traditional AI is still very much critical um, 
uh, in business and in our lives. Original model governance framework, which we updated, is still very relevant to traditional AI systems. And uh, the AI Verify Toolkit um, is very much geared for traditional AI systems. Um, and that continues to be relevant and present today and, and widely applied um, by companies. The reason we had to put out a new framework, or we thought it was appropriate to put out a new framework that builds upon the, the previous one, is that generative AI itself, as you know, presents unique uh, concerns and risks. And we did think that there was a broader ecosystem of issues um, and uh, conversations that we wanted to draw together into one systematic and comprehensive framework. Um, generative AI, as you know, has certain unique characteristics. One of it is that it's, uh, the large language models are foundational, um, and so they are general purpose, um, and the deployments are built on top of that. And that is where the sort of shared responsibility and shared accountability takes on a different dimension in the generative AI context. And of course, the other uh, unique aspect is in the name itself. It's, it is capable of generating its own material. Uh, based on the large amounts of, of uh, input that it receives. Um, and so again, because of that generative aspect, we thought that there were issues, concerns and conversations that we wanted to draw out specifically. And you see that in that new framework, which brings about, which sort of creates an umbrella and that broader conversation. And also, I think, you know, it gives a uh... I will say opportunity for some of them, right? Who has not been on the main trend, and with suddenly with generative AI, you know they are, you know, pushing forward, right? Their AI agenda. So probably, you know, they don't have to worry, and they can get started with this framework, right? We hope so. Okay, going beyond, right? What we are doing in Singapore. So first of all, I'm really proud, and you know, being part of the AI Verify Foundation, you know, it's very exciting, and I look forward to do a lot more. But going beyond Singapore, right? You know. Or uh, I've been working for Asia Pacific customers. I meet, you know, I go different country and meet different, you know, uh, policymakers, and everybody is trying to do something, mm. right? I was just wondering, what's your approach? Like, you know, are you working with, you know, like nearby countries, or, you know, is there is there something like you know collaborative approach coming in? I appreciate the question, and the answer is yes, absolutely. So uh, recently, there was the fourth uh, ASEAN Digital Mi Ministers meeting. The meeting there actually endorsed um, an AI guide uh, for ASEAN. It's called the ASEAN Guide on AI Governance and Ethics. And that includes a recommendation to set up a working group uh, on AI governance. Um, so that's now been endorsed, and we're in the midst of doing that. And that's really a broader recognition that countries um, in our region, and, and maybe even beyond that eventually, um, really need to come together um, and work together on a common framework and, and understanding of the principles behind uh, AI governance. Um, so we were quite happy to play that convening role as chair of the ASEAN Digital Ministers meeting um, in order to seed some of these conversations. Uh, I'm very happy that ASEAN has launched that guide, um, which sets out some key principles uh, about what AI governance is, um, and also makes some national and, and regional level recommendations. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I really see a lot of opportunity, right? Probably we'll try our best to, you know, uh, get that forum where we can come to some kind of, you know, uh, joint collaboration. But I think that is very much needed. So thanks a lot, you know, for leading, you know, uh, for the reason I will say. I think the working group is provides us with a useful platform for conversations and collaborations among the ASEAN countries, um, and it's the guide is really a useful starting point as well uh, to reach some sort of common understanding and alignment. Uh, it's a work in progress, and this is work that um, ASEAN countries will do together in the coming year. Sounds good. Oh. Uh, Maybe, you know, I will say, what is your key message, right, when it comes to, like, the three people, organization, the developers, and the users, right, you know, who are building or using generative AI, what is your key message, right, to each of this group from a, as a policymaker? Well, that's a tough one, huh? but I think 
my, my overall message, first of all, before I get to each group, um, is that we want to create a system uh, where there is a trusted ecosystem for all of these players, a system that has the appropriate guardrails um, to address key risks while maintaining space for maximal innovation. Um, so that is our overall approach. Uh, and among the three groups, uh, the sort of shared responsibility that we talked about is key. Um, and in order for these three groups to have that shared responsibility, transparency is key so that each group is sharing um, the information that it has and it needs to pass on to, to um, the other groups uh, that you mentioned. So model developers, for example, have a certain uh, amount of knowledge and information uh, that should be disclosed and shared to, with the developers. And that in turn, the developers who are creating end user applications and deployments um, have certain information um, and knowledge of sort of risks and mitigations that it can share to end users. End users in turn have the responsibility to use the technology responsibly and uh, level up their knowledge uh, in order to do so and also to protect themselves um, from you know, malicious uses, for example. Mm. Um, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, I think that's for today. And, you know, I think, you know, as you can see, right, you know, what we are talking, the key, you know, takeaway, I will say one is at the moment, right, you know, we put the framework and, you know, it's very comprehensive, first of all. But I think what we are talking about is the good part of the framework is one is the flexibility, given, you know, the things are changing so fast. And second, you talked about the shared responsibility. So it's not just, I think everyone, right, the organizations, the developers, and the user community, you know, all has to come together, you know, to build forward. So that's pretty good. Uh, I will say that's all for today. And uh, we hope to talk uh, more on to, you know, uh, on this stage. Thanks very much, Anup. It was a pleasure. Thank you.